A 10-year-old girl endured the unthinkable. She was supposed to die that night, but this fighter survived to testify against the monster who took her family from her. This is the incredible story of Robin Doan and her family gone too soon. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is going to be an incredible survivor story. If you don't know, I love to cover the survivor stories. I have a whole playlist I will link down below. They are just so incredibly inspiring and just incredible people who go through such traumatic things and make it out on the other side. And Robin is just one of those people. And if you'd like to hear more stories like this or more true crime videos in general, I do post every single week and would love to see you back here if you would like to subscribe. I also wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsor. When Blinkist reached out to me, I was so excited because I've never seen a concept like this and it's incredible. Blinkist is perfect for people who are just completely busy, whether you're just an adult or a parent and you want to still learn. So Blinkist allows you to have bite-sized content that they called Blinks from over 5,000 nonfiction books as well as podcasts and all you need is 15 minutes to understand the most important things about those topics instead of having to sit there and read a whole book and it's not just like a book summary or a podcast intro there's so much more you really get the meat of the topics that you want to learn about they also have so many good books i've been reading one that's called the lazy genius way but i'm excited to bring it to you because it's even better than ever before because blinkist connect has allowed you to share your premium membership account with another person so it's basically two for the price of one right now and you can start a free seven day premium membership trial with my link down below and then you will get 25% off the premium membership. Now let's go ahead and get back to the story. So it was 2005 in Texas and the Conrad slash Doan family lived in Pampa in a very remote farmhouse with quite a bit of land. They were said to be basically in the middle of nowhere off of Highway 70 and they really had a lot of land where they had animals and they were a very loving family. Now this family consisted of 35 year old mother who was Michelle Conrad and 31 year old stepdad who was Brian Conrad. Now they had two children who are actually Michelle's children, but the stepdad, of course, would help take care of them. And so this was 14-year-old Zach Doan and 10-year-old Robin Doan. They had a family dog named Molly as well that they all absolutely adored. Now, Brian actually worked as a farmer, and at this point, Michelle was actually about six months pregnant pregnant. They were said to be a very normal, loving family. They just had so much love within them. Everybody who knew them said that they would really care about other people and they were always just great to be around. Unfortunately, as elaborate as I like to be with who these victims are, there is not much really known prior that I could find about this family. But on September 30th of 2005, 10-year-old Robin Doan would be sleeping and she was actually having a nightmare. She began to hear gunshots and as she began to wake up, she realized that the gunshots were not in her dream, they were in her home. Now this was around 3.50 a.m. and a few hours later, 911 would receive a call from this residence and a little girl was on the other end crying that she wanted her mother. Sheriff's office, 911. Ma'am, uh -huh. there was a shootout in my house. Um, I don't know who's alive in my house, and I'm scared. Where I'm are scared. you at? Um, 7142 Highway 70. It's about 13.3 miles out from the bowling alley. What's your name? Robin Doan, my parents. Um, uh -huh. Conrad and Brian Conrad. I'm scared of this, and I don't know what Robin to do. Robin Doan? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll stay on with you. I've got the ambulance and the fire department to come to, okay? Thank you so much. You're coming. Stay there. You don't see any other vehicles or strange people around your home or anything? No, ma'am. You didn't see a car drive off of any kind? No, ma'am. You just heard the shots fired? And I heard, I saw the lights on in the kitchen, so I'm assuming they stole some stuff. Okay, okay. <gasps> I can't believe it. Okay, okay, okay. 
And all I want right now is my blanket and my pillow. I'm scared. I know you are. I'm scared. I know. I know. Just stay right there. And you're okay. He's there. I hear more sirens. Yes, they're coming. I'm sending it. I've got the ambulance in the car coming for you. Okay. I want my mom. I know you do. I know. There. Now, Deputy Sheriff Chad Brooks was actually the first one to arrive to the scene, and he said he just could not get there fast enough, no matter how fast he drove. But as soon as he pulled up, he saw this little girl outside holding a phone, and he immediately knew that she was the one who had called 911. And so he parked, he got out, and she ended up running over to him as fast as she could and embracing him in a hug. Now, after the sheriff kind of let her know everything was going to be okay, that she was safe, he ended up putting her in the back of the patrol car that he had driven up in and locking the door because he had to go inside with other officers to evaluate the scene and mainly to see if this possible killer that this little girl was talking about hadn't really left. And so they went in and they began looking around and Robin would later say that at this time she was just watching the door waiting for her family to exit and be as completely okay as she was. What they would find was that there was forced entry in the east door, which was like the back door of this house. It appeared to have been kicked in. There were also bullet casings everywhere inside the home and the killer was no longer inside but unfortunately no one else had survived. Outside the home, they found several shoe prints in the mud as well as tire tracks that did not belong to the vehicles of the family. But the only thing they knew at this point was that this was not a burglary gone wrong. There was nothing missing. Robin claimed that the day prior to this, she had woken up on September 29th and her dad had actually made her breakfast, which was her favorite. That was pancakes before she actually went to school. And after school, she was in with her mom who was actually trying on different funny looking maternity clothes and they were just having a good time together. The family had a normal evening and they all fell asleep in their respective bedrooms. Robin would tell officers that when she woke up and finally realized that the gunshots were coming from inside of her home, she began to hear her mother screaming and this was continuously until shots rang out and she was silent. Robin had jumped up out of bed and actually crouched near her door, which wasn't fully closed, but she crouched near the door and she was trying to listen outside. And that is when she heard somebody coming. So she actually took two huge leaps towards her bed where she was gonna pretend to be asleep. And the next thing she knew, there were big flashes. She was being shot at and it happened two different times. What this killer did not know in that moment was that these bullets had missed. This bullet, at least one of them, had grazed Robin on her left side and her leg and her arm, but didn't do any serious damage. Robin then stayed as still as possible and she would watch as this killer had gone into her brother's room, turned on the light and began shooting once again. Robin said that she actually heard her brother moaning as he died. At this point, she said that this person had gone to the kitchen and was almost rummaging through everything and then she did not hear anything and she didn't know where the shooter was if they had left. So at only 10 years old, Robin Doan decided to stay as still as possible and pretend that she was dead. The most heartbreaking part is that Robin said she knew that most likely her family was deceased, but for the next two and a half hours, she lay there without moving on her bed. And after that, she decided that she had to do something. She could not just lay there, but she didn't want to go and look around and see what had actually happened. And so this smart 10 year old girl ran to get the home phone, ran outside with it because it was cordless and she ended up dialing 911. When officers realized that Robin was the sole survivor, Deputy Chad was sent over to be with her and he began asking her, is there anything that we can do for you, Robin? And 
Robin actually said she wanted to go and feed her animals. Like I said, they had a farm and she wanted to just do something normal. And so that is what the deputy did with her. They both went out and they just normally fed the animals. He said that Robin almost had disassociated from reality for a bit and she could just have peace in feeding those animals and he said that as soon as they stopped, the reality came crashing back down for her. At this point, Robin finally asked what nobody wanted to answer to this little girl. Was everyone else dead? And they had to tell her that she was the only survivor. At this point, Robin was taken to the bridge, which was a children's advocacy center where they had specialists who were going to talk to her about what occurred. They were also recording it because it was evidence and they were trying to build a case against this killer. Robin was then asked if anybody had talked during any of this and she said that nobody was talking, but she was asked, you know, did she see anything about this person that she could describe? And she kind of talked about white eyes and I took it as possibly that someone was wearing a mask and that's what she could see through the mask because she also mentioned that there was that flash as he shot her in that bright light. With a child in these circumstances, you never know if they are remembering correctly, if they can remember anything at all, if their imagination is running wild, it's kind of very hard to get evidence from a child. However, they would ask this 10 year old, how many shots were fired that night? She immediately said the number 15. She was asked many other times and she was always saying 15. And so officers had, you know, gone into this home. They were taking her statements with a grain of salt. They wanted to believe her, but they didn't know if, you know, the trauma had really made it so she didn't really remember. I'm scared. I know you are. I'm scared. I know. I know. Hey, Rossi. Oh, my mom. I know you do. You know you're scared. Officers went into this home and they actually found that the bullets that had grazed Robin had struck a plastic drawer that was right next to her bed. No DNA or fingerprints were found inside of the home and the autopsies had been done at this point and they revealed that Michelle had been shot six times. Brian had been shot three times and Zach had also been shot three times and their dog Molly was shot. 14-year-old Zach was actually in his bed sleeping with Sabin, and it's not said that he actually woke up. However, in total, there were 15 shots fired at this residence. Robin Doan had remembered every single one. The murder weapon was then found to be an AK-47 rifle. Now, while Robin was being questioned, it was done very professionally, very appropriately for a child, but it still became too much for her. And she was saying that she couldn't sleep because she was too scared. And then she finally asked if they had to continue talking about it because it was just too heartbreaking. This little girl sounded like a full grown adult on that 911 call in these interviews. And the heartbreaking thing is we don't know whether this is how she acted before or if this is something that her brain just had to come to terms with and grow up very, very quickly because of what occurred. I have a question. Do I really have to talk about what happened this morning again? Because I've told people and I've told people and it just crushes me every time I say it. Okay. So I can't, really, I can't really talk about that again. Now the police were very worried that this killer who was still unknown was going to come back and try to finish the job with Robin. So Robin was placed in a very secure shelter with surveillance cameras with her biological father and stepmother and their children. And that is where she stayed and was not allowed to leave. The only time she was allowed to leave was when she went to the funerals of her family. They had surveillance set up at the church, not only just for her, but also in case the killer would show up and she she was looking at the caskets of her mother, her stepfather, and her brother. Meanwhile, investigators were trying to locate the killer, but there appeared to be no motive for these senseless murders. However, they did not know at this point that all the way over in Missouri, there was another police department dealing with two unsolved murders in their own community. This was 500 miles from Pampa in Pineville, Missouri, where 70-year-old 
Orly McCool and 47-year-old Don McCool were found shot to death inside their home. This murder was found to have happened a day before Robin Doan had called the police about the murders of her own family. But all the way in Missouri, Dawn was actually Orly's daughter-in-law and Dawn had recently lost her husband. So Orly's son had passed away not too long before this. They were found by a relative. Orly had been found shot in the head and Dawn was found shot multiple times. And the McCools actually had a vehicle that was stolen at this time. It was a 2005 Dodge Dakota pickup that was red and it was nowhere to be seen. So they believed their killer could have stolen it. However, with this case, they were making more progress than the case that had happened a day afterwards with the Dones where they had literally no evidence, no information at all. You see in Missouri, the police had canvassed the scene and they found shell casings that were very unique. Some people have said that they were kind of like Russian and not something that a lot of people could buy. But this made one of the officers realize that these had matched some stolen guns and ammunition that were reported missing just the night prior. But the person who stole all of this had actually not been unknown because the person who had called to say there was a burglary actually made the report on their own son. Now, the father was Scott King, who claimed that his 23-year-old son, Levi King, had broken into his home while he was away and stolen several guns. Scott's home was also about a street away from the McCool family home in these murders. Upon looking into Levi King, they found that he did have a criminal record. In fact, he had been sent to prison for burglarizing the neighbor's home and setting it on fire when he still lived at his family home. He was sentenced to 14 years, but was sent to a halfway house about 17 months later. And about a week before the murders of Don and Orly, he had run away from the halfway house and he was now on the run again after murdering two people, possibly, and he was still missing, meaning he could kill more. He would actually be found that same day that the Conrad Doan murders had occurred, but this was in El Paso, Texas at the border where he was actually trying to return to the United States from Mexico after he had already gone into Mexico. He was held and he was brought back to Missouri for questioning. At this time, the Missouri and the Texas police were two completely separate entities. They had no idea that there was this overlap. And so Levi King had told investigators he had guns in his truck, was admitting to that. And 15 minutes later, he was confessing to the murders of Orly and Don McCool. The questioning was said to be a bit disturbing though, because the McDonald County Deputy Sheriff Don Ruby claimed that Levi was talking to him about how he could still remember the gunpowder, the smell of it, the sweat, and the blood smell as well. He then claimed that the feeling of killing was a better feeling than any drugs he had ever done. However, at this point, he was only saying that he killed them because he was scared and he couldn't really elaborate. The McCool murders were being solved. Levi was in prison. However, the murders in Texas were still unsolved two weeks later. Nobody knew if they would ever solve that case. However, Levi King then asked for the deputy to come and talk to him in prison. And that's when he told him, you know there's four more in Texas. At this point, he began to tell this deputy about the murders of Michelle, Brian, Zach, and Robin. He had no idea that Robin had survived. Now, nobody knows why Levi decided to admit to those murders as well. And we really don't know if it would have ever been solved if he hadn't come forward and admitted to them. But Levi King was actually Levi Alexis King, born in 1982. And he was said to actually be a very scary child. He would set fires when he was angry. He would kill animals. And he had six siblings living in this one house that was called like the house on the hill, the King house on the hill is what they all called it. And he was said to be diagnosed at different times in his life with bipolar, with schizophrenia. But the home and the family were said to be quite traumatic. His father and mother were often doing drugs. And Levi was said to start 
doing drugs, drinking alcohol very, very early. The family home was said to be decorated in knives and guns, and they were really just not the best role models and environment to be in. And so hearing this, Levi's defense for both the McCool and the Doan murders were really pushing for Levi to appear as this sad, pathetic man due to his childhood. So on April 18th of 2008, for the murders in Missouri of Don and Orly McCool, Levi actually made a plea deal. That would make it so that he was ineligible for the death penalty, but he would get two life sentences without the possibility of parole in Missouri. He would also plead guilty to the murders of the Conrad Doan family in Texas. However, the DA had spoken to Robin who had said that she wanted the death penalty. And so the DA said that even with the plea deal, he was not going to exclude the opportunity to have him sentenced to death. Robin was only 14 at this time, but she was asked, you know, if her family's killer should get the death penalty. And she said that he did this to her family, that she was going to have to sit in front of a murderer who killed her loved ones and testify. Even though she didn't want to testify, she was going to do it for her family's sake who didn't have a voice. But she was very, very nervous. She was terrified and she did end up breaking down in tears during it. And she said that she was trying not to look at Levi, but she eventually did. And his cold stare was one of the worst feelings that she's ever had in her life. She ended up telling Levi on the stand that she was haunted by her mother's screams from that night. Now, those around her who helped her through this entire thing have said that Robin left the stand crying and then began sobbing afterwards, and they believe that that was the first time that Robin truly let out her grief. But she was not the only one to testify. A girl named Rebecca Mitchell also took the stand, and she said that she had been friends with Levi's younger sister, as well as Levi, and that she was always at their home. She gave a little insight into the King family and said that they lacked rules, they didn't have boundaries, they had access to drugs and alcohol, they could basically do whatever they wanted as kids. And she even claimed that Levi's father, Scott, once even lied to the police for them. I don't believe she elaborated on what this was for though. Rebecca went on to describe Levi as a compassionate person, a great listener, a good friend. And she said that when someone's a good friend, you stand behind them even when they make bad decisions. However, she also said that she did not ever see anything about Levi, that she would believe that he was violent or capable of murder. Levi's older sister, Prairie, also testified saying that she hadn't seen Levi in years due to him being in prison, but that once he was arrested for these murders, she had actually contacted him. They were talking through letters and she decided to read a part of one of the letters that Levi had sent. And she read his words that said, I'm sorry, there was such news to be told. I'm constantly tormented by how much pain I caused. Please forgive me for any way this horrendous act has become a part of your life. Now, Prairie was saying that their parents never cared about them and that their father was actually just as responsible as Levi for his actions and that he should be, you know, prosecuted for them as well. She said that Scott would abuse their mom as well as the children. He would even shoot the family pets in front of them and make them do the same. And in a shocking revelation, Prairie revealed that one of their siblings, their brother Spencer, had actually been shot and killed inside their home when he was 13 years old and this was said to be accidentally due to a friend of his having that gun that their father had actually given to them. However, many people have pointed out that, you know, all seven of these kids endured that same horror and it was horror and it's not diminishing that to say that none of them have turned out the way Levi did. None of them have turn to murder because of their past. Now, a Child Protective Services caseworker did also take the stand, claiming that the home situation once got so bad that the two younger brothers were put into foster care. I'm not sure if Levi was ever in foster care, but the caseworker did know a lot about Levi and in fact said when he was a young boy, he was evasive, sneaky, and lying, and that he basically knew he was gonna be a good criminal. 
Now often children in foster care or who are around the foster system, they will have this sort of behavior and that is actually diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder, which may be what Levi actually had. Now, like I said, investigators found evidence that he had once been diagnosed with bipolar schizophrenia and they said that when they were trying to talk to him, he acted psychotic, that he heard voices and that he was running around knocking things over. Hearing all of this on October 6th of 2009, after seven hours of deliberation in Texas, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. One juror had voted against the death penalty and it had to be unanimous. Many of the jurors were actually crying when this verdict was read, but this meant that he would actually be serving time in Missouri and would be extradited back there. Now, Robin had said that she did not want to feel bitter and angry with everything that had happened, so she had decided to forgive Levi King. She gave an impact statement and she ended up telling him at his trial everything she felt, but he didn't even look her way. Robin has since explained why she decided to forgive him, why she said this to him in court. She told Texas Monthly, I don't know why I said what I said. Maybe I just wanted him to know that I wasn't going to let my life be ruined by him, that I wasn't going to let him take away the best of me. I wanted him to know my life was still going to turn out good no matter what awful things he had done to me and my family. Now, Brian Conrad's mother has said after the trial that there was no such thing as closure, that the trial was just another phase of life that they had to get through. She said that it has torn them all apart and that a part of them is gone and will never be the same. Now, I found two interviews from Levi who has been interviewed while being in prison and one was by Investigation and Discovery where he claimed that he felt relief after the murders. It appeared as though he had continued killing from the McCool family to the Conrad Doan family as a sense of peace. So for the first time in your life, you felt better. Yeah, yeah, like content almost. Like everything just stops. Any concern for anything, for, for my leaving, for um, my dad, for what I was gonna do next, any of it. It seemed like everything that I would faced not, not just from that point, but, but like all my life, all the chaos and everything was just done with. You still feeling that? Yes, peaceful yeah, feeling? yeah, completely, like, like no concern for anything. Had you ever felt anything like that before? No, no. Does it dawn on you that you've just killed two people? Um, honestly, there, there's not even a whole lot to say. Um, there were several hours of just driving. As I was driving, the feeling started to slowly come back. I felt killing somebody else again was going to bridge the gap. In another interview with a &E, he spoke on what could have set him off that day of the murders and really what could have been his motive, if you can even call it that. You see, he claimed that he had run away from that halfway house and he went all the way back to his family home. However, his father did not want him there and told him to basically get off his property to kick him out. And so he ended up going back, vandalizing the property, and then he stole the guns. He then was on his way out of town when he found a home that he believed was empty and he broke in. This was where I was raised and I wasn't welcome there. I wasn't good enough. The fact that I was being rejected by them was probably really what uh, set me off, I guess. He said that he heard that Don and Orly were coming home, so he hid and waited for them. And then they walked inside, and he immediately walked up to Orly and shot him in the temple. He said that Orly had no time to respond when he was killed, and that Don actually came down the stairs to see what was going on. And Levi ended up shooting her in the hip where she fell down, and then he continuously shot her to make sure that she was dead. He explained that he then began driving the stolen truck from them when he happened upon the Conrad Doan residence and he said he just wanted to feel that peace again. So he kicked in the door and immediately started killing with Michelle waking up and being the first one shot. He said he then shot Brian and then when he was walking through the house, he saw Robin moving back to her bed and shot at her. He said that he didn't shoot her after that because he did not see the small girl as a threat. He then killed Zach and he said after this, he looked in the mirror and he didn't feel that same rush as the first murders that he felt empty. 
He also claimed that when he had gotten caught at the border, he actually wasn't trying to get back into the United States. He had fled to Mexico to get away from all of this, but he had gotten lost and turned around and ended up back at the border. And thank goodness he did. While he would live the rest of his life in prison, Robin was living the rest of her childhood with her biological father and her aunt, who she calls her adopted mother. And she continues to live in Pampa, Texas or around there, and she does not want to run away from her home. She was out of school for a couple of months after all of this, and she was saying that, you know, everybody would stare at her when she would go out. But she did eventually go back. But she went through school as normally as she could. She joined the cheerleading squad. She did basketball for a while. She even got a job and she was set to graduate in 2013 and the community raised $10,000 to help pay for junior college for her. She was said to really just want to be a normal teenager, but she was very, very close with the law enforcement officers who had helped her that day, especially Deputy Sheriff Chad. And she says that every time he gives her a hug, it feels like that same hug that he gave her that day when he was the first one there. But she has told Texas Monthly that she feels like the community just waits for her to implode, that they always think she is just going to have a breakdown. She said, it's like a game for them, waiting to see if I'm going to mess up and have some breakdown because of what happened to me when I was 10 years old. I mean, I once dyed my hair a different color and the word spread that I was finally going off the deep end, but I've kept my head on my shoulders. I was raised better than that. Though she has admitted that she does not like being alone because she'll start to think of what happened that night and what she could have done to save her family. Now she continues to have nightmares and paranoia and she's very superstitious. She says that she went to sleep that night with a long sleeve shirt, long pants and socks. So she will never go to sleep in an outfit like that again. She also does not sleep with her door open and is scared of the dark. But she has also said she doesn't want pity. I don't let what happened keep me down. No. No. Sorry. That's not me. That'll never be me. From what I could find, Robin did plan on going to Texas A&M University and becoming a pediatric nurse. She said that she wants to be there when the children are hurt and she wants to be there first. And she told Texas Monthly that she wished that she could tell her mom that she was becoming a nurse because she thinks that she would have liked it a lot. But Robin has said she doesn't know why she survived or what her purpose is, that maybe it's to help her future kids get through life or help other people, but she knows it's gonna be great when it comes. Was the motive as Levi later said that he was simply angry at his father and decided to murder many people because of that? Do you believe he would have continued killing if he hadn't been caught? Or did that sense of peace that he said that he didn't have after the second murders would that have stopped him from killing more? Due to the interviews that I have watched, it really doesn't seem like there's any sort of remorse for what he did. He can talk about it and he can give you all the facts and exactly why he did it, but there does not seem to be any sort of apology or guilt. Please send so much love to survivor Robin Doan. She is around, I think, 27 now. She is a survivor, a fighter, and a beautiful, smart soul who went through something that no one should ever have to. What an inspiration. She decided through the tragedy to still live a good life and still do good in the world. And that is something that everyone should look up to. That is what retelling these true crime stories is about. Not about the monsters but about the people like Robin Doan. Please send her all the love down below and please remember the Conrad Doan family, Michelle, Brian, Zach, and also the McCool family, Don and Orly. They were taken for no reason other than a man's rage at his own dad. Also, don't forget to check out that link below for a 25% off the premium membership of Blinkist. You don't want to miss out. So don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough. And I love you to absolute pieces. Okay. Bye.